Hello and welcome to History Byte to our Cold War series. Today we're looking at the big three conferences at Tehran, Yalta and Potsdam. We're looking at the agreements they made and also the impact these conferences had on the relations particularly between the US and the USSR as the Cold War begins. So we're going to start off by looking at the Tehran Conference in 1943. This was going to be the first time that the Big Three had ever met in person. Before then, Churchill had previously met separately with Roosevelt at the Atlantic Conference in 1941, as well as a further seven times after that, including at Casablanca with French President Charles de Gaulle and in Cairo with China's Chiang Kai-shek. He had also met with Stalin separately as well in the Moscow Conference of 1942. However, in Tehran in 1943, this was the first time that Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill would meet together to discuss terms for Europe. The first major agreement was that they would aim to force Germany's unconditional surrender. The Allies also agreed that Germany would need to be split after the war. However, at Tehran, no solid agreements were made as to how this split would look. They also agreed that an international body should be established to mediate future problems through discussion and negotiation, a more successful version of the League of Nations that would later become the United Nations. Another agreement that was driven by Stalin was the necessity for the Allies to open up a second front, particularly in France. If the US and Britain could attack via the West, then Germany would be forced to redirect troops to meet a joint attack. This would ease the pressure on the Eastern Front, where the Soviet Union were facing huge losses of soldiers. The date for this second front was set as June 1944 and would eventually become Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings. The land belonging to Poland and their freedom was also discussed, but Stalin was adamant about protecting his western borders and so refused to give up the parts of Poland he had seized in 1939 when he had joined with the Nazis. But they couldn't agree on this matter and Stalin was being stubborn about it. So at Tehran, the Allies agreed that for now, Poland would gain land from Germany that the Nazis had taken from the Polish when they invaded in 1939. On Stalin's side though, he agreed to declare war on Japan and supply Soviet troops to help the USA in the Pacific theater. But Stalin only agreed to do this once the war in Europe was over. So there were a couple of agreements made at Tehran that made it a fair conference not a great conference, but not a bad one either. Stalin and Roosevelt had worked quite well together. However, as the war continued and further conferences were held, Stalin's post-war aims would cause a rift between him and his Western allies. It was obvious to the West that Stalin had still not decided to show his entire hand yet. So the next conference was held two years later, in February of 1945, in the small town of Yalta, in the Crimea in the USSR. Since Tehran, the war had progressed well, and the Allies' attack on D-Day had successfully opened the Second Front. The Allied troops had even liberated Paris in August of 1944. So by the time of the conference, Britain and the USA were closing in on Germany from the West. However, the Soviets had been even more successful in the East. They had pushed the Germans back out of the USSR and were now within 40 miles of Berlin, ready to deliver a final defeat while controlling most of Eastern Europe. This gave Stalin a stronger bargaining position at Yalta and he intended to keep hold of the territory he'd won as a buffer zone between him and Germany for future security, but also as a sphere of influence. At this time, the USA was so concerned with defeat in Japan that it needed Russian support if it was going to win the war. Therefore, Roosevelt knew he couldn't be too tough on Stalin at Yalta and needed to keep Stalin on side. We have to remember that the USA didn't have the atomic bomb at this time, so it wasn't in such a strong bargaining position as it would be at later conferences. So what happened at Yalta? Let's talk about the agreements that were made. First of all, Stalin reaffirmed his intention to declare war against Japan, but again he insisted he wait until Germany's defeated. This was pleasing to Roosevelt because the Japanese Pacific Theater was dragging on. The Allies agreed that in April 1945, the United Nations would meet for the first time, with all the nations being allowed to join. 
This did cause some tension because Stalin had wanted the 16 republics of the USSR to be represented separately, but Britain and France had been against this for fear that it would give the USSR too much of a controlling influence in the UN. Instead, from the whole of the USSR, they allowed just Russia, Ukraine and Belarus to join the UN. Germany was one of the most important parts of this discussion at Yalta because they were so close to defeat. The Allies agreed in principle to disarm, demilitarize, denazify and divide Germany. The key agreement here was that Germany would be split into four zones, with each zone being controlled by a different nation. One zone for the USA, one for Britain, one for France and one for the Soviet Union. Many people considered that this might be the start of the Cold War because the Allies had actually agreed that through Germany, Europe would be split between East and West. The disarming and the demilitarizing of Germany was similar to after World War I, as the Allies hoped to weaken Germany and prevent future aggression. Reparations were also to be requested from Germany to the tune of $20 billion, with half of it going to the Soviets for the devastation they had faced. The addition of denazifying Germany would mean, among other things, banning the Nazi party forever and prosecuting war criminals at the end of the war. However, there was a great fear by the USA and Britain that Stalin wanted to keep hold and keep control of those areas he had liberated as he had swept through Europe defeating the Nazis. However, much to the relief of Churchill and Roosevelt, Stalin actually agreed that the governments of these countries would be decided by free, open and fair elections. While this was a highly doubtful promise, mainly because Stalin had already started instituting the framework of communist influence in these countries, Churchill and Roosevelt couldn't do anything. They had to rely on Stalin's word because they still needed his help to help finish Hitler and end the war. But where Tehran had gone smoothly, at Yalta the Allies stumbled over a major issue of contention, the Polish question, what to do with Poland. Stalin was still adamant about keeping his influence in the region and refused to give up any land that he had conquered from the Poles in 1939. He also wanted a pro-communist government installed to give security to his western border. The USA and Britain preferred a non-communist, democratic government led by the London Poles, a group of Polish politicians who had fled Poland when the Germans had invaded and had formed an exile government. In the end, they couldn't come to an agreement about what to do with Poland, and Stalin again was being stubborn about his possessions. Therefore, in order to form Poland's western and northern border, the land would be taken from Germany and given to the Poles, but the eastern border would be drawn along the Curzon Line, its 1921 border. This meant that huge parts of what used to be Poland before the war would remain in Stalin's possession, affecting the shape and makeup of Poland. This made Churchill uneasy though, because it gave Stalin huge gains in land and resources. At the end of Yalta, Roosevelt and Churchill now realised they had doubts about Stalin's intentions for Eastern Europe. Yes, Stalin had promised free elections, but how could it be guaranteed? The issue of Poland had created tension between Stalin's intentions and those of his allies, and it was something that both Churchill and Roosevelt knew would prove to be a very difficult issue to resolve once the war ended. The final meeting of the Big Three took place between July and August of 1945 in Potsdam near Berlin. Although the Japanese had not surrendered yet, the powers had gathered at Potsdam to decide on how to administer Germany now that they had surrendered nine weeks earlier on the 8th of May 1945. Potsdam is remembered as being the last of the big three World War II conferences, but also the most strained in relations, and this was mainly because they were no longer fighting the Nazis, so their common enemy had been defeated, but also because there was a large number of changes that had occurred since Yalta, and had created a different tone for the conference at Potsdam. Talking about changes, the big three itself had almost completely changed. Roosevelt had died three months before, and had been replaced by Harry S. Truman. Truman had planned to adopt a get-tough attitude towards Stalin and was more suspicious about the Soviets' intentions than Roosevelt had been. Churchill and the Conservative Party had also lost a UK election to the Labour Party that same month, so Clement Attlee had become the new Prime Minister and was eager to wrap things up quickly to return home and take charge. These new personalities may have caused strained relations and changed the dynamic of relationships between the East and the West. 
It was also interesting that Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, wasn't even invited to the conference, a slight that he never forgot. And to top it off, things got strained when the USA revealed a new dangerous weapon, the atomic bomb, which they had successfully tested on day two of the conference. The USA had even purposely delayed the whole conference until July in order to perform the test to give them the edge and a better bargaining position at the conference itself. Despite all of this, though, a number of very important agreements were made at Potsdam. Although Yalta had agreed in principle to divide Germany, at Potsdam the four-part split of Germany was finally agreed, with the addition that the economy would be run as a single identity. To denazify Germany, the Nazi laws were now abolished, all prejudicial rules were removed, and a complete overhaul of the Nazi curriculums in schools and of the politicians in office were undertaken. This meant no more SA, SS, Gestapo. No more restrictions on free speech or on religion. Germany was to be democratised so that people's freedoms could return. But the big question for Germany now shifted from Germany itself to Berlin. What would happen to the capital which now lay inside the USSR's part of Germany? The Allies agreed that Berlin, like all of Germany, would also be split into four zones between the USA, Britain, France and the Soviet Union. When it came to reparations, Stalin insisted that the Germans pay heavy, but Truman resisted this because he wanted the economy to recover. So it was agreed by the Allies to change the Yalta Agreement so that each administering country could take reparations from its own zone. The Soviets complained that they controlled the poorest zone, so it was also agreed that they could take a quarter of the reparations from the other three zones. But again, that looming question of Poland and the fate of Eastern Europe rose again, and again it was met with resistance by Stalin. The West had known that it would be a contentious issue, and they were right. Since Yalta, the Soviet Union had taken tighter control over these countries, and Stalin, going back on his word, had set up a puppet communist state in Poland, neglecting the London Poles. Stalin argued that these were defensive measures for Soviet security, but Truman objected to Stalin's control and began to see the Soviets not as liberators, but as conquerors. But Stalin wouldn't budge, and this created a huge amount of tension between Truman and Stalin. So although there were agreements made at Tehran, Yalta and Potsdam, it was clear by the end of 1945 there had been a division now between the East and the West. This tension was coming from the fact that Truman and Stalin disagreed over the fate of Eastern Europe. Stalin was citing that he needed control for defence, whereas Truman saw him as aggressively trying to push his communist agenda on Europe. Since Churchill was no longer Prime Minister, it looked like the USA and the Soviet Union, the two new superpowers, were going to be locked in a period of mistrust and mutual suspicion. For the rest of the 1940s, this suspicion would only continue to grow. If you enjoyed this video and would like to find out more about history, why not subscribe to our channel or follow us on Twitter or Facebook?